uh, um, we're going to be talking about uh, algorithm techniques for GPUs. And um, just before we start the lecture, there are a couple uh, logistics. Uh, I'd like to introduce Albert uh, Slynik. Uh, Albert, stand up. Uh, he's going to be the TA for your lab section. So uh, one of the things that you're going to do next week, hopefully it's going to be fun, is to work on a piece of code that incorporates um, pretty much all the techniques that we'll be talking about in the next few lectures. And um, so uh, I have the, uh, the, the pleasure to talk about these techniques. And then I'll be flying away. Okay? So by Saturday night, I'll be gone. But you are going to be here, and Albert is going to be here. So do yourself a favor. If there's something that doesn't sound right, or doesn't, you, know, you, you, you don't feel like you understand it, or maybe I didn't explain it right, ask questions. Okay? So that uh, Albert doesn't get to answer all the questions next week. Right? So Albert will really appreciate it if you answer, uh, ask all the questions now. Right? Um, so um, you know, we're going to be spending six lectures talking about some very commonly used algorithm techniques for GPU programming. Some of these techniques are actually the, the real reason why people say programming GPUs are hard. On the other hand, if you really understand these techniques, it can make your life a lot easier when you program GPUs. So sometimes we will say these algorithm techniques separate the ones who can do this and ones who cannot do this. I'm not going to be talking about programming models, um, even though we, sometimes we do talk about it in other contexts. But today, these algorithm techniques are actually going to be uh, relevant no matter what programming models you're going to be using. Okay, these are really the fundamental ways you need to organize your computation in order to use GPUs properly. Can you hear me in the back? Somewhere. Great. Okay, so uh, we're going to be recording this. So uh, I'm, uh, I think we're, uh, I'm going to move around, but hopefully uh, with a wireless Mac and so on, uh, the recording quality is going to be good enough. And um, uh, we also have quite a few lectures that now we're posting from previous summer schools and whole semester courses. I'm going to make, be making a few references um, along the way that um, if you want to learn more, you know, obviously we cannot talk about everything in six lectures. So um, you know, if you want to learn more, hopefully um, we can uh, refer you to the websites where you can listen to uh, more detailed lectures and then uh, read up some of the material. Okay. So uh, I'm going to start by talking about why some of these techniques are important, especially in the GPU uh, context. And um, um, most important goal here is for you to master the commonly used techniques, and especially the simple ones. And um, you know what? As a computer scientist in, uh, in training, uh, we always like to brag about the complex algorithms and you know, uh, very challenging techniques and so on. But uh, after 25 years of teaching career, I started to realize that only the simplest algorithm techniques get used by you know, everyone. So you know, uh, I'm going to do my best to introduce the simple ones, okay? the simple ones that many, many people have been u using and uh, get, uh, able to get uh, benefit from. In particular, I'd like to uh, help you to understand um, the GPU hardware limitations and constraints. There are a few first order constraints that you really need to be aware of and try to get around. And once you understand those, it's like you know it's going to rain tomorrow. Okay, so that, that, that's a good knowledge to have. And it's, there are some desirable and undesirable computation patterns. You, you hopefully you will be able to tell by looking at a particular description of how someone is planning on doing the computation, or even looking at a piece of code, you will know this is a desirable pattern or this is not a desirable pattern. In terms of rain, a desirable pattern will be you go out holding an umbrella. An undesirable pattern is you go out without an umbrella, right? So it's, you know, hopefully it's going to be as simple as that. But it, in general, it's not quite as simple. And you do need to have quite a bit of knowledge in order to be able to tell. And the third one is 
I'd like to you know, introduce to you some commonly used algorithm techniques to convert undesirable patterns to desirable patterns. If you really don't have an umbrella, maybe you can take your friend's jacket and then you know, put it up. right? So that will be one technique. And uh, using your friend's jacket in general is a little better than using your jacket. You know? So you know, there, there are cost issues and so on. So, you know, it's, there, there are some interesting you know, ways you can get around these problems. So why are we talking about GPUs today? Because um, the GPUs are currently the most computationally efficient devices if you can use them effectively. So um, this is a, a, a chart that uh, John Owens maintains. And I, I didn't have time to get uh, the, his new version now that we're, you know, we finished 2010. Uh, he should have a new version. But um, you can tell that uh, the peak performance of these GPUs are about 10 times of the, uh, the CPU countertops, uh, con uh, counterparts, and the memory bandwidth is somewhere around six times um, you know, higher than the CPU counterparts. So um, you know, well, there's quite a bit of you know, potential if you can actually use them uh, properly. But also, the GPUs are in every PC. You know, well, every, every Apple uh, laptop from this point on support CUDA-enabled uh, GPU programming and OpenCL for sure. So these are the kind of, you know, well, it, these devices are no longer niche devices that um, you can you know, find once in a while uh, when someone builds an exotic computer. These things are all over the place. And um, so you know, if you write a piece of code, from this point on, you will be able to write that, uh, you know, run that piece of code, GPU code, on many, many computers. There's some fundamental um, design differences. And I'm pretty sure you're going to be hearing about this uh, several times. So I'm going to just kind of quickly touch them. And I'm only going to be talking about the relevant parts for the algorithm, you know, uh, uh, for explaining these algorithms. So I'm not going to go into depth. So um, in this particular case, um, you will typically find on the G uh, a CPU today a fairly large amount of cache, sometimes called L2 cache, sometimes called L3 cache. And you can hold quite a bit of data working set into these caches. Whereas in the GPUs, um, you know, there will be very minimal amount of cache. Even the L2 cache on uh, Fermi today is f so small that with so many threads running, you cannot really expect to be able to go back to the cache and find the data later. Okay? It's really there to help you, to, you know, to, to somehow share your input with other threads and assemble the data in a form uh, that uh, will be suitable for you to use. So um, there will be one lecture where we're actually going to be talking extensively about how you can make use of these smaller caches more effectively um, in these you know, uh, GPUs. And one of the, uh, the, the important message here is there's the green uh, tiles are the computational uh, tiles. And these things are, you know, they have, you have tremendous amount of these computational resources. And the trick is really to be able to move data into these very small storages and then use them very, very effectively and, uh, by this large number of uh, consumers. So um, there are a few things that, um, you know, well, I'm going to show you two machines. That, um, uh, one is the one that you'll be using next week. And it's a UIUC NCSA AC cluster. And this machine has 32 nodes. Each node has four GPUs in there. And, um, it's a Tesla box. And uh, the GPU is donated by NVIDIA. And um, uh, the host boxes are funded by NSF. And this is uh, based on the GTX 280. It's the pre one generation older. But this machine is very stable. It's, you know, it's being used in many summer school. And um, you know, uh, uh, the additional work for us to support this class here is minimal. Okay, so you know, it's a legacy you know, uh, system. And um, uh, if you uh, run a columbic summation code for, uh, 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 for uh, molecular dynamics, um, each node can uh, hit about 1.78 uh, teraflops per node, single precision. And um, if you measure it's going to be about 271 times speed up over one Intel uh, QX, QX 6700 CPU core. 
and you can use the four core and eight core and divide some of these numbers and get your own conclusions. But this is a pretty powerful system if you know how to drive this kind of stuff. There is a um, less production-oriented system. It's called EcoG. And this is a kind of a working example of why some of these systems that um, you know, what David was talking about in his keynote will likely be GPU-based. And um, it's one of the most energy efficient supercomputers in the world. It's number three in the November 2010 Green 500 list. It has 128 nodes, and uh, there's one GPU per node. And um, you know what? It, it hits about 934 megaflops per watt for Limpack. Okay? It's a very, very energy efficient system. So if someone has been telling you that um, these GPUs are incredibly power inefficient, that's not true. Okay, there's, there's a existence proof that it's not true. It's actually much more energy efficient in terms of megawatts per, uh, you know, uh, uh, mega flops per watt compared to pretty much all the CPU-based systems. And then, uh, you know what, it, it hits about 33.6 uh, teraflops double precision impact. So this is a pretty impressive machine. And um, in fact, five years ago, um, you will have to be you know, one of the government labs in order to be able to, to, to have this kind of system. But today, this system is really built by Illinois uh, students and NVIDIA researchers. And um, uh, this is the, the picture of the, uh, the system. Two big racks and then uh, 64 um, you know, nodes on you know, each rack and with some big fans. And then you know, well, we pretty much get it going, right? So this is what um, you know, David was talking about in his talk. You know, we are really at the point where you know, any country, any university, you know, well, with about half a million dollars of funding, you can build something really, really use, uh, helpful. And just to make Rich happy, uh, the QCD code, uh, you know, uh, the milk code actually runs on this system and get really high performance. So, you know, uh, uh, Guo Changxi in NCSA actually ported the new milk code on, on this one and did all the, you know, all the interesting um, uh, conjugate gradient solver phases and then uh, get the end-to-end uh, -end performance, uh, you know, pretty good um, impressive performance out of this system. There are many, many other things. So you know, I, I assume that this is the reason why you are here. Um, you, you, most of you are probably working on one of these kind of system, um, applications. And um, uh, these are the applications that uh, we collected uh, into the GPU computing gems books that, are be, uh, that will be coming out this year. Uh, the first volume is coming out end of January. There were uh, 50 application examples so each chapter talks about one of these applications. And um, also, the source code of that application is actually available through gpucomputing.net. So you can read the chapters. You can see how the, uh, how the authors uh, you know, get performance out of those applications. You can go to gpucomputing.net and actually look at the source code and use their source code uh, um, for your research and so on. So how do these people do it? You know, what are the kind of secret sauce and what are the kind of things that um, you know, they have to suffer or they have to enjoy in order to get that, those kind of uh, results? Um, typically, this is what happens in their workflow. Um, most of these people use GPUs for you know, computational intensive components of their uh, applications. And usually, there's some kind of approach that is considered impractical because these things are too computationally intensive from a historical perspective. But uh, usually, it's, um, but then you, the, some poor grad student with lots of patience has, has demonstrated that this approach can actually have some domain benefit, such as faster conversion in, in the big picture, or uh, more accurate results, or something, you know, uh, or some kind of observation that you can make that other approaches cannot uh, give you. So uh, you know, uh, uh, two quick examples is convolutional filtering, uh, you know, uh, from the image uh, from a video processing point of view, or de novo gene assembly from a genomics point of view. These things tend to be, you know, if you ask someone in that field, they will say, ah, those things are too expensive, and then you will see 
GPU computing James article kind of thing saying, ah, no, 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 it's not too expensive. You know, well, after you implement it, you can get you know, this kind of performance. So basically, the GPUs will be uh, accelerating the most time consuming aspects, uh, aspects of these things. Kernels will be written you know, today, actually mostly in CUDA, but um, we're beginning to see an uh, increasing number of OpenCL kernels. And um, uh, then you need to refactor your host code to better support kernels. And um, for those of you who went to the, um, the lecture this morning, Pi, you know, PyCuda, PyOpenCL, you know, those are the, you know, the kind of programming models that can actually help you to more easily incorporate these kernels into your, uh, you know, in, into your applications. And then you rethink the domain problem a little bit and then see if you can you know, uh, uh, further uh, you know, uh, take advantage of these applications. So I'm going to be talking about uh, these algorithms, and I'll be showing some code examples. So I'm going to quickly touch the relevant parts of the CUDA uh, programming models so that everyone's on the same page, that um, you know, the, uh, the code examples will not become encrypted you know, uh, something you know, uh, uh, secret, and everyone can understand the code example. So, the CUDA OpenCL execution model, you know, they pretty much share the same execution model. Okay? And the execution model is fairly simple. You have a view of host and device. The host is uh, mostly to execute um, serial or moderately parallel parts of, the code, uh, of your uh, application. And then the highly parallel parts are in device or uh, SPMD, single program multiple data form. And um, this is the, the, the kernel code that uh, Andrea was talking about this morning. You know, uh, so um, the, you know, the typical uh, scenario is that you will be executing uh, host code for a little bit uh, in serial, and then um, you will be launching a parallel kernel. And the parallel kernel is written in terms of a kernel function, and the same kernel function will be executed by a large number of threads. Okay? And in the uh, newer models, you can launch multiple kernels, and then uh, each, you know, they will, so you'll have multiple kernel functions executing. Each one will be executed by a large number of threads. And um, so um, this is a kernel launch uh, example where you have a, uh, essentially the name of the kernel, and then uh, in, in CUDA, this is a configuration, um, uh, essentially a launch uh, configuration about the organization of your threads, and then th these are the uh, original arguments uh, to your kernel function. And so after the parallel execution, you have serial code, and then you have parallel code. Uh, we would typically talk about asynchronous versus synchronous kernel launch. For this uh, asynchronous kernel launch, uh, what we do is we will launch the kernel, and we will immediately execute the, um, the, the sequential part so that the C the, the host code and the kernel code can overlap in their execution. And this will become very important for some of the binning algorithms that we're, uh, I may be able to get to by Friday. Okay? And um, uh, that's, those kind of algorithms help you to be able to take full advantage of this asynchronous uh, program execution. And um, some of the things that um, Andrea was talking about this morning, the queuing and so on, will actually all play into that, but no, so I'm going to take advantage of the fact that Andrea was uh, uh, able to cover some of those concepts. Well, um, a couple quick things. Um, you know, uh, we talk about compute device. Uh, this is typically a, a, uh, you know, a, a, a CPU, uh, a coprocessor to the CPU, and then it has its own DRAM, um, you know, device memory, and runs many, many threads. And um, you know, they are called threads in CUDA and work elements in OpenCL in parallel. And it's typically a, a GPU, but can also be another type of parallel uh, processing device. IBM, for example, supports OpenCL for their uh, power, uh, you know, CPUs now. So uh, multi-core CPUs, and then uh, the device in that case will be a uh, you know multi-core CPU. The data parallel portion of the application expressed as uh, kernels. And they will, uh, which will be run by many, many threads. The difference between GPU and CPU threads tend to be that the GPU threads are extremely lightweight, and you want to have thousands of them to be able to get performance. 
whereas uh, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, C GPU threads tend to be much more heavyweight, and you tend to want to have relatively few, such as eight these days on a uh, multi-core CPU. So if you look at a implementation of the uh, OpenCL or CUDA for multi-core chips, and you know, uh, uh, for example, there's a tool from my group called MCUDA, we will typically merge multiple CPU cores uh, threads, uh, sorry, multiple GPU threads into a single CPU thread in order to, to, to bridge this kind of gap. But conceptually, you can think about all the kernel you know, execution as executing by a large number of threads. And um, uh, that will be reflected in, uh, you know, throughout all the lectures. A couple of uh, uh, important things. In the, uh, when you read the kernel code, you would uh, expect to see a single piece of code that will be executed by many, many threads. And these threads will, uh, will be using a concept of thread ID, okay, or, or thread index, and um, to distinguish themselves. They, would, um, they are building variables that are accessible to each thread. Essentially, they are, uh, you know, they're initialized by the, uh, the CUDA runtime uh, for each thread, and these numbers essentially allow each thread to go to a different part of the data structure and execute the same code but on different parts of the data structure. So this is how you know, CUDA um, you know, supports uh, data parallel execution. And then um, there are also a, a higher um, uh, organization, which is the block organization. And um, uh, in OpenCL, it's called uh, work groups. And these things, you know, uh, uh, the uh, multiple threads will be organized into this thread block, and you have a thread block index that allow you to also go to different parts of the data structure. So you have the two weapons. One is the block uh, index, and one is the thread index. Each thread can be able to can take these two indices and then index into the data structure and you know, work on a particular part of that data structure. Okay. So um, turns out that there are multiple dimensions of these things. And um, uh, especially for PDE solvers, I noticed that uh, before I came here, I, I looked at some of your background, and uh, quite a few of you are PDE you know, people and uh, you know, CFD you know, type of uh, you know, application developers. So uh, for, for most, of the, most of you, you will be using multiple dimensions of these thread index indices and block indices to be able to get to different parts of your grids, okay, when you solve these uh, equations. Okay, so I think we are, um, so just to make these things more concrete, here is a vector addition kernel that I stole from Michael Garland at uh, um, NVIDIA. This is probably the, the simplest um, you know, example you can find for, uh, for CUDA programming. So uh, you will use global, uh, underscore, underscore, global, underscore, underscore, to mark a particular function as a kernel function. As soon as you mark it, this function will be executed by many, many, many threads. And um, uh, so these are the parameters that you can pass into, this, uh, you know, into the kernel. And uh, these, these uh, uh, pointers are actually pointing to the, uh, the data that's already delivered into the uh, device memory. And uh, obviously, before you call the kernel, you need to do the uh, memory transfer and so on. And uh, you know, Andrea was talking about this this morning. And once you get into the kernel, remember the same piece of code will be executed by many threads. So the uh, the first thing that each thread does is to look at its own thread index and its own block index and uh, determine a index into the data structure so that uh, you will be able to take its own responsib uh, responsibility in the input data structure and generate the output you know, that is under its own responsibility. So this gives you massive disjoint execution and um, uh, uh, you know, uh, in a massive form. Now, in the main program, um, you will be uh, invoking this kernel with some kind of configuration. And this configuration says, I'm going to have 256 threads in each block. And then uh, I'll take my entire vector and divide that by 256. That, that gives me the number of blocks I will need in order to cover my entire data structure. 
So I have enough blocks, I have enough threads in the block, and then I have the parallel execution. So when you call the kernel, you will supply the configuration, you will supply all these parameters, and each thread in the kernel will, uh, will take the block index and the block dimension. This is actually the, uh, the, the, uh, the dimension from the uh, invocation uh, configuration and the thread index. And then uh, you, will, um, you will go into the, um, the physical hardware with all these values, and then you will be chunking away okay, execute, uh, to execute that, um, the algorithm. So that's pretty much all the CUDA background you need in order to understand the rest of the lectures. Okay? Um, so now I would like to transition into you know, well, how, why you need these techniques and how some of these techniques help address these uh, problems. In order to, to take full advantage of these GPUs, you actually need to have three important, uh, what I call the first order character, uh, characteristics in your code. Okay? The first one is easy to understand. You need to have massive parallelization in application algorithms. You typically need to have a large data structure, and the par different parts of your data structure can be used, can be computed separately, which is, may or may not be the case in some large data structures, such as graphs. Okay? The Laney, you know, uh, mesh refinement kind of things tend to violate this kind of you know, uh, assumption. And it, it, it makes it very, very hard for GPU programming. The second one is regular computation and data accesses. You want to have similar work for parallel threads. And um, this may sound straightforward to you, but for a lot of real application algorithms, this can be very, very tricky. Especially when we start to talk about, you know, well, even some of the massive algorithms such as um, you know, uh, electric, uh, electric, uh, electrostatic potential calculation. If you want to get some efficiency out of these algorithms, sometimes you have to sacrifice the regular computation. And so one of the lectures is actually about how you can actually kind of slightly viol violate these rules, but get the best balance. Okay, that, uh, that hopefully by the end of the sixth lecture, you will get some appreciation of how uh, people do these kind of uh, you know, work. And then the, um, you need to avoid conflicts in, uh, in critical resources. There are two important things to keep in mind. One is off-chip DRAM bandwidth. Okay? The off-chip DRAM access is extremely, extremely expensive in terms of the uh, bandwidth available. So if you want to have very, very high calculation rate, you need to somehow reduce the number of times you go out to the DRAM. And I'm going to, you know, I'm going to have several examples to, to, to help you do, to visualize this for your own applications. And this, the, the second one is a little bit um, you know, more subtle. Um, you, you can have conflicting parallel updates to common data structures. So whenever you need to, be, uh, to, to increment some kind of common uh, counter, where you need to dequeue something from a FIFO, these tend to be common data structures that will be serialized, uh, that will have serialized access by all the parties trying to access them at the same time. And that can also become a very bad limiting factor for you. And a lot of the algorithm techniques are actually about you know, uh, uh, changing the, uh, the strategies in your computation to be able to maximize. The, um, the positive characteristics of uh, in these three categories. And you know, we would like to think that uh, you know, as a computer scientist or computer engineer, we like to think that we are the smartest people in the world, right? Uh, we have invented everything. And the truth of the matter is, um, if you look into, you know, sort of look around you, you will notice that none of the algorithm techniques are unique. Okay, all the algorithm techniques that we can think of, other people have already thought about hundreds of years ago. Okay, and they have been used in all kinds of contexts for hundreds and hundreds of years. For example, um, you know, well, whenever you need to have massive parallel operation, 
we, everyone knows that you have to regularize your uh, operation. So whether it's Navy, you know, uh, fleet, or uh, Air Force, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, formation, or Army, you know, uh, marching to, to battle, uh, you know, all these, uh, all these guys know that unless they regularize their formation, they will start to have all kinds of problems, okay? And in less military context, um, this is a picture from uh, you know uh, uh, of L, uh, one of the freeways uh, in LA, and um, you know uh, you you can probably see that um, there is a you know very very regular formation of cars you know uh, moving through the system, and then um, uh, this is a uh, a large wedding banquet, so uh, you know uh, you, if you have something like a thousand people in these banquets, um, you know I would probably expect you to take the food as is rather than trying to customize your food okay and that's regularization okay even if your steak is slightly overcooked do not try to complain about it <laughs> okay at least not in my kids wedding so um, this picture is taken about a quarter mile away from my house uh, you know, those of us who live in Illinois, um, in, in the U.S., know we can mass produce food. Okay, this, these are. Uh, let me do a quick test. How many of you know what these are? Yeah. Oh no, no, you you know. How about soybean? Ow! Oh, this is corn. This is corn before July 4th. There's a saying in the Midwest. Um, you know what? I was from California, so <laughs> it took me a while to learn these things. Um, uh, Corns should reach knee high, okay, as high as your knee by July 4th. If they don't reach the height of your knee by July 4th, it's going to be a bad year, okay. So this is, this picture must be taken before July 4th because the, the height. In fact, that's the reason why you think it's soybean because soybeans tend to be about half of your knee height, okay. So you know what? This is the, the side benefit of coming to this lecture. Okay, you you not only learn about CPU programming, you also learn about corns and soybeans and so on. And this is an iPod factory. Okay, even though um, you're getting all these very stylish iPods and you know they look great, they're st stylish. The way they produce them is actually you know uh, pretty mundane. Okay, you have. Lots of people sitting, and then uh, you know they're all kind of uh, assembling, and then they're all doing the same things. Okay, and then there there are a couple, uh, you know, like these are grad students, and then the professors, and you know, <laughs> supervising, right? Okay, so that you know regularization. Okay, and so you know what? Uh, I'm going to come back to this point in uh, you know quite a few of those uh, algorithms. And what are the hurdles? You know what, uh, David mentioned hurdles, right? So you know what, uh, hurdles means thesis. So that's why we, we like hurdles, right? You know what, in academia, you know, if there's no hurdle, then there's no thesis. There's no thesis, there's no grad student, there's no grad student, there's no professor, and you know, uh, bad things happen. So um, you know what, we, uh, the hurdles are really serialization due to conflicting use of critical resources, oversubscription of global memory bandwidth, and low beam balance among parallel threats. And this is a picture taken um, near uh, near the Bay Bridge uh, toll plaza, and um, uh, you know uh, whenever you have this kind of you know a bottleneck oversubscription, and then a little bit of you know someone tried to change lane here, okay, uh, bad things happen. Okay, so you know uh, you, you know, what what we're going to be doing here in the in the next few lectures is you know what well, we would like to, uh, I'd like to to help you to begin to build your ability to translate and formulate your domain problems into computational models that can be solved efficiently by available computing devices okay and um, you you need to understand the relationship between the domain problem and the computational models okay so you know what well, don't confuse the models that you're learning from the, the real problems, okay? The, the real problems are physical and so on, but, and then you have some models that help you to, you know, to deal with those uh, physical things. And then you need to understand the strengths and limitation of computing devices, and you need to be able to define your problems and models to you know, <coughs> enable efficient computational solutions. A couple of things uh, before we go into the uh, technical details. Um, you know, the conflicting data access you know, is is really a real problem all over. Okay, it's not just in computing per se. Um, in any kind of massively parallel execution, you know, there, there, it, you really cannot afford 
serialization. And I'm showing two serialization pictures. And um, you know, well, I, uh, I, I think that the bottom picture is pretty clear, right? Um, you know, well, there, um, you, this is what? The security, right? So you know, well, whenever you have a you know, well, ch uh, serializing uh, ch uh, choke point, you know, especially those new machines that they're, you know, they're deploying in the US airports, um, you, know, uh, uh, you, you have this kind of line, right? And who knows where this picture is taken from? Very close. Which theme park? They, they, it's actually Disneyland, Anaheim, California. So you know what? It, whenever you have this kind of queue, you know it's painful. But a lot of times when you write your algorithm, you don't realize that you are subjecting your threads into this kind of queue. Okay, and if you if you don't want to stand in a queue, don't subject your threads to the same torture, okay? So this is the intuition I want you to develop, okay? You, you should be able to look at your code, your computation, and start to think about your threads as your, your friends, okay? And, <laughs> and start to, you know, to, to see how they suffer, and then, then you, you're, you're halfway there. Okay, so a simple example. Um, you know, let's say uh, I have a uh, naive inner product algorithm. Okay, someone you know, decided to write, uh, to take a inner product algorithm and make it parallel. And the inner product is very easy to do, right? You you take all these pairs of elements, and you multiply them together, and then you you, you get the you, you you get the um, you know then you add add up all the uh, products, and um, the serial code, you know, will typically look like a simple loop, right? And then uh, you know for each iteration you will take you know, two elements from the input, do a product, and then accumulate. A very, very simple, straightforward conversion into parallel is by taking the, the loop iteration and make them into threads, okay? And then every thread will take a pair of elements and multiply, right? And then you say, hmm, I learned about something like a critical section in my, uh, in my computer science class. So I understand that if I need to accumulate a value into a variable by multiple you know, parallel threads, I need to do an atomic operation. You know, well, I'm so proud of myself, I still remember that from my CS course. So uh, I will just take the, the accumulation and make it into an uh, atomic add to a variable. And sure enough, this thing will work. Okay? It will produce the, the, the right result. However, what you, you know, what you may or may not have realized is that um, you know, well, even though you, you think you parallelize this algorithm, the addition is going to be all serialized, okay? Because uh, the atomic operation is done in such a way that uh, someone will succeed and everyone else will wait, and then someone else will succeed, everyone else will wait, and you, you essentially you form this, this long queue. So for this calculation, let's say if you have you know, a million pairs that you're trying to do, um, half of your operations will be serial, and half of your uh, you know, uh, operations will be parallel. This may sound a little bit brain dead. You say, you know what, I know this. I can, you know, I, I can do a, a tree high reduction and so on. That's exactly the point. The point is, oftentimes, people don't realize what they're doing. It's, as soon as you start to think about what you're doing, the solutions are not that hard. Okay? Now, so there's something called Andal's law here. If a fraction x of your computation is serialized, the speed up cannot be more than one over uh, one minus x, because the serialized portion does not get helped by the parallel execution. And in the previous example, x equal to fifty percent. So even though you, you may be using a million uh, threads, you can get no more than two times speed up, no matter how you know uh, how, how how many computing cores are are used. And when there, um, it, this is actually one of the interesting problems that students make again and again and again when they work on their real applications. Okay, you know, when they when we tell them you're working on reduction, they know exactly what to do. But as soon as they move into their applications, they they stop thinking, right? And then they start to run into this kind of problem. Global memory bandwidth. This is the picture I want you to keep in your in your head when you look at uh, global memory bandwidth. Ideally. You would like to be able to access your memory data 
just like um, you know, getting water out of the reservoir. Okay, you want to be able to open up the gate and then whew, here comes the, the water. Okay, and in reality, you know, you're really using a straw to sip from that reservoir. Okay, and so you know, I, well, I want you to think about the straw all the time. Okay, this thing is going to be how you're going to be getting your, your memory data. Okay, it, it's not this. It's this, okay? And so whenever you need to, you know, you, you need to get a large amount of water, you know, you're going to suffer. You're going to really suffer here. So, you know, you, you better be able to, you know, to make a good use of all the water that you, uh, you, you manage to get out of that straw, okay? So why did I say that? If you, you know, well, if you look at the numbers, this is what we call, typically call the uh, speed and feed numbers, right? And uh, for any parallel system, you know, those are, you know, there's some first order numbers that you, you know, you always need to, uh, to know before you program. For Fermi, which is the latest, uh, you know, uh, uh, generation, um, you can get about a, a one teraflops of single precision peak, about half a teraflops of double precision uh, uh, peak. And then it comes, you know, there, there are different ver slightly different versions of the memory uh, peak bandwidth depending on the particular chip that uh, you, you get. But, you know, uh, nominally you can think about it as about 150 gigabytes per second peak of chip memory access bandwidth. If you don't think about it, just looking at these numbers, you, you, you may or may not be, uh, you know, uh, uh, very meaningful. But if you start to translate 144 gigabytes into floating point operands, each floating, a single precision floating point operand is four bytes. So that gives you 36 gig operands for single precision and 18 gig operands for double precision. So these are the operands that you can pull from the memory into your chip per second, okay? Large number. And in fact, if you don't believe that these are large numbers, I would highly recommend you do the following exercise. Sometime tonight, after dinner, start to write from one to a thousand. Okay, just do it once. If you have never done this, I really recommend you do this. Just write from one to a thousand. You may be surprised how long it will take. And then you think about it this way. Take all that pain, multiply by a thousand times. That gives you one million, right? And then multiply that pain by a thousand. That gives you what? One gig. Okay. So it's a thousand times a thousand of the pain that you wrote a thousand numbers. Okay. Why do I know this? Because when I was a, in elementary school, I was not the best student, and um, uh, I kind of like to talk, and my teacher did not like it. So the teacher decided to keep me busy. So the teacher ended up asking me to write from one to a thousand. Um, you know, uh, every time I talk, right? So you know, uh, the, the teacher never realized that he, she helped me to become a good engineer. I really got a good sense of numbers. <laughs> okay. okay. So you know, uh, here if you calculate this a little bit to achieve peak uh, throughput, so you can look at the numbers in both ways. You can say that, well, in order for me to keep, you know, to, to, to uh, achieve peak throughput, which is, you know, one teraflop single precision or half teraflop double precision. Oop, oh, oh yeah. great, thanks. And then say, okay, good, thank you. You can take the 1,000 gigaflops and divide it, and divide it by 36 you know what, well, gigaflops, uh, you know, uh, 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 36 giga operands, then it will tell you that you need to be able to do 28 single precision floating point operations every time you get a single precision operand from the global, from the uh, DRAM, okay? So you better be able to chew on it and chew on it and chew on it every time you put a bite into your mouth, okay, 28 times. And un unless you can do this, you will be waiting for operand, okay? You're, you're not gonna be able to achieve the peak, the, re, the, the maximal performance of your chip. And there's another way of looking at it. If you can only support 36 you know, gigabytes per second 
And then uh, you, you, you need to be able to do uh, fetch one operand per computation. Then you can only sustain, you know, assuming that each operation takes only one floating point operand. Obviously, most of them take two, right? You can only sustain 36 gigaflops for, for this bandwidth. And that 36 gigaflops is actually what? Out of 1,000 gigaflops. So it's about 3% of your peak bandwidth. So you'll be running your chip at about 3% of your real performance potential. Okay? So there are multiple ways you can look at this. And they all lead to pretty much the same algorithm strategy that you're going to have to, uh, to use. Yes? So there was a number there for double precision. Yeah. I, I think it could be twice as large, the, the number of flops that you need to do. To oh, yes, yeah, 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 yeah. It's, uh, 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 Right. Yeah. So uh, it should be bigger rather than smaller. In fact, uh, it could be comparable because uh, you know. Uh, yep. You're right. Uh, it needs to be uh, twice as much. Uh, wait. 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 No. 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 It's not twice as much because the double precision rate is half. So that's why the number of operations you need to do is smaller to achieve the peak rate. Simply because the peak rate is, is lower. Yeah. But, 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 the, but the size of the word is twice. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So that, that's why I say it should be comparable. That, uh, not, not bigger. Yeah. That's right. It should be comparable, 28. Thank you. So the um, low balance. You know what? Um, this is uh, yet another um, kind of a engineering um, consideration for your algorithm. Um, I think David actually mentioned low balance quite a bit in your keynote. And um, uh, for those of us who have been bitten by low balance, it's one of your worst enemies in parallel execution. Okay? And um, you know what? In general, if you decompose your work into parallel jobs, a good decomposition is when everyone pretty much have you know, similar amount of work to do. But in a lot of cases, in reality, you may end up with you know, something like this, where you know, one or a few of those end up with a, lot of, a large number of, uh, uh, a large amount of work. Why is this bad? Because if you, let's say, divide 100 units of uh, time, uh, work, uh, un work into, let's say, 10 um, you know, uh, threads, and if, we, if you divide them evenly, you can expect roughly about 10 times speed up. But if you divide them unevenly, such as 50, 10, 5, 5, 5, 5, 5, 5, then you, the most you can get is actually two times speed up because you're going to have a bottleneck here who will finish the work in half of the time of the, pre, uh, the original um, uh, time. So that's why whenever you have an um, you know, uneven workload in parallel uh, threads, you're going to have you know, fairly um, uh, a big impact on your speed up. Why is that the case? In reality, most of the work in balance did not come from the fact that the programmer doesn't know how to write code. Most of the time, it's because people use a piece of code on a data that is very imbalanced. And when, when the person wrote that piece of code, the person did not explicitly address the data distribution problem. So let me give you one example. Um, this piece of data is actually from a spiral scan of the MRI machine. And uh, most of the, uh, the new MRI machines now use uh, this style of uh, scanning in order to be able to, to finish the physical scanning part faster. So the idea is to take a lot more sample points in the critical parts of your case space and then uh, take no or little uh, few samples in the space that did not affect the quality of the reconstructed image so that it can do things faster. However, if you receive this piece of data and try to reconstruct it in the uh, case space by dividing up your case space and have each thread to process a part of the case space, then you will have very different amount of data points depending on where you are. And each thread can end up with a large number of um, you know, amount of work or no amount of work. And we're going to be talking about this in the, in the binning part of the uh, algorithm. 
many, many real problems uh, in astronomy, in uh, computer vision, in rendering, and so on, have this kind of property. Okay? So what are we going to be talking about? We're going to be talking about um, you know, a subset of these techniques, tiling, privatization, regularization, compaction, binning, data layout transformation, thread coarsening, and scatter to gather transformation. These are the, essentially the building blocks of efficient GPU algorithms. And um, they actually uh, address sometimes overlapping, sometimes non-overlapping aspect of things like contention, bandwidth, locality, efficiency, low imbalance, and CPU leverage. So um, we're, um, obviously, with six lectures, I won't be able to give justice to all these things. But what I'm hoping to do is to give you good coverage of a subset, and then have you interested enough that you will go and listen to the full lectures from a full semester course, and then uh, apply that to your own applications. Okay? So I'm giving you the, um, you know, the, the URL where you can actually look at all the, um, you know, all the detailed lectures. Courses, en uh, Engineering, Illinois, EDU, ECE, 598HK, slash HK, okay? Oh, oh no, the, the slides are all available, so it's all recorded, yeah. So, you know, uh, someone, right before this lecture, someone said, um, you know, uh, um, he was told that um, GPU programming is impossible, okay? That, uh, you know, he shouldn't even try, okay? I, I, you know, I overheard that conversation. And, um, you know, so I, I anticipated, uh, you know, uh, this kind of uh, conversation. So I'm showing you a, a apparent in, uh, impossible task. So this is from a, uh, you know, a Chinese acrobat uh, performance. So, you know, you can see that uh, there is a, uh, there's this uh, uh, woman who, who did a handstand. And, uh, on this uh, you know, man's uh, head, and then uh, you know each of them is uh, maintaining the spinning uh, you know plates, right? And the woman, which uh, was not shown here, uh, I'm saying that this is not given for justice. The woman is also uh, spinning all the plates on the other in the other hand, right? So you know what? Um, this is you know what a lot of people envision GPU programming to be like, <laughs> okay? And but you know what? Let me really emphasize that computational thinking for GPUs is not as hard as you may think. Most techniques have been explained, in, you know, if not at all, at the, uh, so have been explained at the level of computer experts. And a lot of these things were not really you know, taught and explained in a way that application developers can really understand and apply them. So the purpose of this course is really to make them accessible to domain scientists and engineers. So if you are a PDE person and you, know, you feel that, oh, I'm out of place, you know, I'm, I don't belong in this kind of course when people talk about algorithms, you're wrong, okay? You're really supposed to belong. And if you do not understand some of these things, then there's something wrong with me, okay? So you should be asking me to re-explain or to reiterate some of these explanations. So that hopefully brings us back on time. And uh, so uh, this afternoon, I'm going to go into the first uh, technique, which is the, um, the parallel scalability transformations, mostly using um, scatter to gather transformations. Okay, so I'll see you this afternoon. Thanks.